welcome everybody to Birdie Hour. My name is Serena Lau and I am with the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, or SFBBO for short. SFBBO is a nonprofit based in Milpitas with the mission to promote sustainability in the Bay Area and beyond by engaging communities in avian science, habitat conservation, and education. Our staff and volunteers conduct bird surveys, ban birds, and restore habitat in many parts of the Bay Area to better understand and conserve birds. And of course, there are a number of local like-minded birding organizations dedicated to appreciating and conserving birds. So we thought it would be fun to bring as many of these groups together as we can and highlight some of the amazing hotspots and birds we have throughout the Bay Area. So that brings us to tonight's special series, part one of Birding the Bay Area. So joining us this evening are Ohlone Audubon, Golden Gate Audubon, and Mount Diablo Audubon. Now, this is part one, as I mentioned. So we do, in fact, have part two and three covering other parts of the Bay Area. So if you haven't already done so, we hope you'll register for those and join us. Now, we do have a lot to get through, so we'll go ahead and jump right in, starting with Ohlone Audubon Society. And welcome, Ohlone Audubon members. I know many of you are joining us tonight. So presenting on behalf of Ohlone Audubon is Field Trip Chairperson Bob Tolino. So Bob, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Great, thanks. All right, so hi, I'm Bob Tolino, a Field Trip Coordinator for Ohlone Audubon. Um, Ohlone Audubon has been around for more than 50 years and uh, our area covers the Southern and Eastern parts of Alameda County. Um, we also do a conservation work in that area and do a lot of uh, cooperative collaboration with Golden Gate Audubon and other Audubon groups in the, in the area. So um, in picking uh, four birding sites from our area, I tried to choose ones that represent a good portion of the, the diverse habitats that our area covers, while also highlighting some of what I consider to be the not to be missed birding hotspots in our area. So the first hotspot I'll be focusing on is Coyote Hills Regional Park. And uh, after that, we'll cover Hayward Shoreline, uh, Guerin and Dry Creek Pioneer Regional Parks and Mines Road. So as I mentioned, the first I'll be covering is Coyote Hills. And uh, in terms of diversity of habitat, sheer numbers and variety of birds and possibility for rare birds, Coyote Hills is just about, in my opinion, the best birding location in the whole East Bay. Um, it ha <clears throat> habitats in the park include freshwater marsh, grassland, riparian corridor, rocky hillside, chaparral, and oak woodland. And adjacent to Coyote Hills are the former salt ponds that are part of the Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, the trails from Coyote Hills connect to those, uh, the levees in Don Edwards, and that provides a contiguous habitat that adds extensive salt marsh and tidal mudflat habitat to explore. Uh, from the trails within Coyote Hills. Um, nearly 300 species have been reported in and around Coyote Hills. And uh, on a single 11 mile hike one day, I, a group of friends and I detected 109 species on a single checklist, which is almost impossible at, at most plate, you know, at most single locations that in the Bay Area, you have to get to drive to get those kinds of numbers. So Coyote Hills is just amazing. Here's a map that shows uh, some of the trails and you can see those uh, the salt ponds out here as well that uh, just extend that, you know, they're really part of the park, in my opinion. Um, so parking uh, is uh, pretty easy there. Um, there is the, the entrance to park is on Patterson Pass Road just off of Paseo Padre Parkway. And there's one free dirt parking lot at that intersection if you're willing to hike a little over a mile to get into the park. A lot of people do that and they'll either hike or bike in. Um, but there are also multiple parking lots inside the park, including one at the old quarry area, a paved lot uh, near the visitor center, and they're also building a brand new paved lot just inside the entrance kiosk. Um, the parking fee to get into those lots is $5, and you can also um, if, you know, the, if you need to, you can park at the Dumbarton Quarry Campground, which is on the, the southern side of the park near the Dumbarton Bridge. And uh, uh, last month when we had all the heavy rains, this was the lot you had to use to get in because Patterson Pass Road was completely flooded at the time. 
Um, almost all the trails in the park are relatively flat, obviously, except for the ones that go up into the hills. Um, and most and many of these trails are also ADA accessible, um, especially uh, the there are hmm, some boardwalks that run through the freshwater marsh and uh, those are all also ADA accessible. Um, there are bathrooms available near the visitor center and multiple porta potties uh, at other um, parking lots and a few along the trails in the freshwater marsh as well. And uh, many trails are excellent for birding by bike if you have one, just because to get out to those salt ponds is a pretty far distance. And so uh, bike can be very helpful for that. Um, the variety of habitat, as I mentioned, in the park is just incredible. In the grass uh, along the entrance of the road, there's a, just about the only population of ring-necked pheasants in Alameda County. Um, abundant freshwater ponds on the east side of the hills support good numbers of wintering ducks, gulls, coots, and rails. Um, and with those boardwalks that go through the freshwater marsh, it, it's one of the best places to actually get looks at rails like Sora and Virginia Rail. Um, the the salt, freshwater ponds also host a small number of hard to see American bitterns that actually breed there, so you can see them in the summertime. And uh, in the <clears throat> in the fall, uncommon or uh, migrating shorebirds um, can be seen. Uh, also, like uh, in, you know, in the within the park, uh, we've had rough solitary sandpiper, stilt sandpiper, and semi palmated sandpiper. Um, owling is also excellent in the park. Um, you can find short-eared owls hunting on the during the winter time out on the, the levees and the salt ponds and burrowing owls. Uh, you know, there are at least six or seven burrowing owls that winter in the park uh, on, on the grassy hillsides. Um, and a tiny population of rock wrens lives in the quarry area, which is a, a unique population for the western part of the county. And the chaparral and oak covered hills in, near the visitor center regularly host rare birds, including some recent ones like the uh, sage thrasher, vesper sparrow, and brown thrasher. And uh, tens of thousands of shorebirds feed on the tidal mudflats near, uh, near the Alameda Creek outflow if you ride all the way out to the edge of the bay. Um, and yeah, for that, that, you know, for that kind of birding, you probably want to have a bike just because it's quite a number of miles to get all the way out to the bay from there. Oh, and uh, I should mention that our, our the local escapee uh, Chilean flamingo that many people call Fernando um, is often seen back there. And even though it's not a countable species, it's uh, still really cool that he, he's been back there for close to 15 years now. I kind of got ahead of myself a little bit. Next is, I'll be covering Hayward Regional Shoreline, which is uh, my local patch, uh, just a five minute drive from my house. Um, Hayward Shoreline sits on the edge of the bay just north of the San Mateo Bridge and consists of 1,841 acres of salt and freshwater marshes, seasonal wetlands, and some grassy area as well. About 300 species have been found within the park boundaries. Um, there are three areas that people typically use to access the park. Um, at the northern end is the Grant Avenue entrance uh, in San Lorenzo. Um, then there's the West Winton Avenue entrance, uh, which is uh, one of the one that most people would access, uh, especially if they want to go to some of the more popular spots in the park. And then on the southern end, right down near the San Mateo Bridge, uh, at the end of Breakwater Avenue, is uh, some uh, street parking down near the Interpretive Center. Um, and they, they hold events at the Interpretive Center on occasion to have art shows. And uh, it's also a good place to see the, the turn islands, which, are, which were created, created habitat for nesting lease turns. Um, the, parking, oh, the parking lots are open from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. daily, but most of these spots also have parking that's accessible uh, all times of day. Um, there, there are a, a few locked gates, but as long as you don't park inside the locked gates, you can typically access the park even outside the regular hours. Uh, 
and no, there's no charge uh, at any of those locations for parking. Um, trails in the park are almost entirely flat. Um, so they're mostly quite accessible. There are some dirt trails that are not fully accessible, but uh, most of the, the trails are, are either paved or gravel trails. Um, there's a restroom at the Interpretive Center, and then there's a, a porta potty at Grant Avenue and a, and a pit toilet at, at uh, West Winton. Um, having a bicycle can be helpful, but is not, not strictly required typically. Um, and so the birds at Hayward Shoreline. Um, at the southern end, uh, about a one mile walk from the Interpretive Center uh, was the, the nesting island I mentioned uh, that was created for California lease terns. And uh, during spring and summer, you can also see hundreds of nesting foresters terns, dozens of nesting lease terns, black skimmers, and, uh, <clears throat> and those are all viewable from the lease turn sign, which is about a one mile walk from the Interpretive Center at that breakwater entrance. Um, there was one uh, rare laughing gull that showed up a few summers in a row. Um, and, uh, oh, and uh, also this time of year in, in May, in, in the springtime migration uh, in May and sometimes early June, we get uh, migrating black terns um, and in very small numbers. And the Witten Avenue entrance, there are two, uh, Two distinct birding areas in there that uh, that have been given unofficial names that you might hear about: Frank's Dump and Mount Trashmore. And uh, Frank's Dump, uh, or I'm sorry, Mount Trashmore is the grassy area that's right next to the um, West Winton Avenue parking lot. And uh, if you go up on that slight rise, it's a, a large grassy area and uh, hundreds of geese winter there, mostly Canada and cackling, but sometimes uh, snow or rosses will show up, as well as uh, nearly every fall, Lapland longspurs are found on, uh, on Mount Trashmore as well. And then about a half mile north on, along the Bay Trail uh, from Mount Trashmore is Frank's Dump. And Frank's Dump is an old salt pond that uh, typically has islands in the middle of the pond where large numbers of shorebirds congregate at high tide. And this is one of the best high tide roosts that I know of anywhere in the East Bay, typically. Um, it's usually good for seeing red knots reliably in the wintertime. Um, and there have been a few uh, extra rare birds like a bar-tailed godwit and a redneck stint that were found a few years ago there. Um, those were both in the fall, during fall migration. Um, during spring and summer, snowy plovers nest here, and uh, they, uh, though, so they, they actually can control the water coming in and out, and they actually have prevented the water from coming in to try and help the snowy plovers uh, in their nesting there. And uh, one thing to note is that due to the recent heavy rains, the Frank's dump is now completely full of water, so it's not particularly good for shorebirds right at the moment. But hopefully by the fall, that, uh, that some of that water will dry out and it'll be back to, to what it was. Here's just a couple pictures, one overhead shot and one of the, the tens of thousands of shorebirds that show up at Frank's dump. Next park on the list is Garen Regional Park, which is actually two connected parks, Garen and Dry Creek Pioneer. Um, and uh, these two former 19th century ranches encompass about 5,800 acres with uh, 35 miles of trail that wind through the grassy hills and rich riparian area, including one small pond. And here's a park where you can see these two very connected parks. They're really pretty much the same park with all the trails running through them both. Um, there are two uh, parking lots uh, that you can park at. There's uh, <clears throat> the Garen Avenue uh, staging area, which is at the end of Garen Avenue, and then the Dry Creek staging area. Um, the Garen website says it's five dollars per vehicle, but the but the kiosk hasn't been attended for years, and so you can typically park wherever you like for free. Um, and uh, 
personally, I usually start at the Garen entrance and hike uh, from there, but uh, the Dry Creek entrance takes you more directly into the, the mixed oak woodland that runs along the riparian area. Um, not too much of Garen is accessible. Um, I would say only the half mile or so of trails that's right around uh, the, the Garen uh, Barn Visitor Center. Um, but the area, that area right around the visitor center can be quite birdy, even you know, with relatively limited habitat. Um, there's one restroom at the visitor center and some picnic tables there, there, are, there but there are no restrooms or accessible trails uh, up, uh, from the Dry Creek and uh, from, yeah, from the Dry Creek entrance. Um, So for the birds, springtime is really my favorite time to visit Garen. Um, nesting, bullocks, orioles, house wrens, and lazuli buntings are singing uh, from the area around the visitor center and near the creek. If you hike up into the grassy hills, uh, you can find singing grasshopper sparrows up there. And uh, it's well, active ranch land though, so you will encounter a few cows. Um, if you walk past Jordan Pond south, you can uh, head toward, uh, toward a long dry creek through the shady oak woodlands with uh, small bridges crossing the creek back and forth. Uh, during the springtime, songs of black-headed grosbeaks fill the riparian corridor and occasionally migrant Hammond's flycatchers are also seen during springtime. And uh, although it's not technically inside the park, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the large patch of uh, Pride of Madeira that's along the steep part of Garen Avenue, about a half mile uh, outside that entrance. Um, and uh, there's a huge patch of, uh, of Pride of Madeira there that uh, when it's in bloom like it is right now, uh, as many as five species of hummingbird can be seen in that patch in a single day. And it's one of the most reliable places to find calliope hum hummingbirds during migration. And the final spot I've picked is uh, Mines Road, <laughs> which it rises from the, the vineyards just outside Livermore, past Lake Val and Southeast up into the hills of the Diablo Range. Um, it's nestled into the far southeast corner of Alameda County, and the road is some of the least developed land left. Um, it runs for most of its length parallel to Arroyo Mocho Creek, and it hosts some very unique habitat in the county. Um, it spans oak savanna and chaparral through most of its length and leads up into pine forests at higher elevation before continuing into Santa Clara County. And, and San Antonio Valley. Um, <clears throat> mile markers dot the road along the way, so birders will typically refer, refer to something like mile point 10.03 uh, if they wanna mention where they specifically found a bird. Um, unlike uh, the other sites that I presented here, Mines Road is not really part of a park. It's just a uh, public road with excellent habitat. Um, as such, Parking typically happens wherever you can find it along the road in uh, safe, wide enough pullouts for your vehicle. <clears throat> uh, there are really no walking trails. All birding happens along the roadside there, and there are no public restrooms anywhere on the route. So you'll want to uh, probably stop in Livermore on your way and you know hit up a Starbucks or something. <clears throat> Uh, this, the habitat out here being so undeveloped uh, is really some of the best habitat to find some unusual birds in Alameda County. Um, Rufus crown sparrows are common, and there's a small population of hard to see bell sparrows, usually near Artemisia. Um, Yellow-billed magpies, Thanopepla, Lawrence's goldfinch, greater roadrunner, and prairie falcon are all species that are not really easily seen in any other places in the county besides Mines Road. Um, it's an excellent spot to pack a lunch and uh, spend a full day birding. Um, you can also uh, continue on to, uh, to San Antonio Valley, which is in Santa Clara, Santa Clara County, and in there, Lewis's woodpeckers are are pretty commonly seen. Um, you can also, uh, it, 
Mines Road meets with Del Puerto Canyon Road, which is one of the best birding roads in Stanislaus County if you wanted to continue down that road and, and make even more than a full day of birding. Um, likewise, owling can be excellent along, along Mines Road. Um, Western screech owls are common as, as well as uh, uh, quite a few northern pygmy owls, and there are even a handful of breeding long-eared owls up in those hills, um, in addition to the more common owls like great horned and barn. Common poor wills can also be heard in the spring and summertime, although keep in mind that obviously nocturnal birds like these are much more often heard after sunset than seen. Uh, in any case, that's uh, my whole presentation. Um, yeah, if you want to uh, learn more, uh, you can visit aloneaudubon.org to, uh, to potentially join our organization and uh, subscribe to our Kite Call newsletter to get more information on our field trips, programs, and conservation efforts. Thank you so much, Bob. Great birds, great spots, including some areas where SFBBO does work. So um, again, thank you so much for that. That was great. So uh, next up, we have Whitney Grover, who is the Deputy, Deputy Director of Golden Gate Audubon Society. So thanks, uh, Whitney, over to you. Yes, uh, thanks so much for having us. And I, I cannot wait to go check out Garen. I don't think I've ever been there. And so this was really inspiring to me. Um, so yeah, my name is Whitney and um, my email address is here. If you have any questions for me later, um, feel free to email. Um, so, Golden Gate Audubon, um, it, we're in perfect contrast to, um, to Bob's list because our area is super urban. <laughs> so uh, we cover San Francisco, Alameda County, I'd say the parts of Alameda County <laughs> where it's very urbanized um, and um, part of Contra Costa County. Um, we have over 20 free field trips a month, classes, speaker series, we do habitat restoration, um, Berkeley Bird Festival, um, we host three Christmas bird counts in SF, Richmond, and Oakland, and then um, have a, a bunch of um, bigger conservation issues that we work on. The first um, spot I want to talk about today is the Dotson Family Marsh. Um, so the Dotson Family Marsh is part of Point Pinole Regional Park. Um, it's on the very southern um, uh, border of, the, of Point Pinole. Um, it's an East Bay Regional Parks District Park, and it's in Richmond. Um, this is sort of a zoomed in um, to sort of where the parking lot is. So you enter on Goodrick Avenue, and then there's parking here. It's free. Um, it's a small lot, but it, um, I've never been there when it's full. Um, there's also a restroom in that parking lot. Um, not very accessible with public transportation, um, but if you're really adventurous, the 71 bus does um, come about 30 minute walk away. Um, so maybe a bus and a bike would work. Um, the trail conditions are, are flat, it's very flat, um, wide, well-packed gravel. Um, and then uh, the routes that you can take basically from the parking lot, it's sort of an out and back, not, not a loop, but it, um, this right here, this green line is the Bay Trail. So you can follow the Bay Trail all the way into Point Pinole Regional um, Park from, from Dotson Marsh. So you can kind of make the walk as long or as short as you want it. Um, oh, excuse me. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of this park because it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, so the, the marsh is located um, right between the Bay and Parchester Village. Um, Parchester Village was a post double World War II um, planned community, and it was actually the first of these kinds of planned communities in California that allowed African Americans to purchase homes. Um, and in the 70s, uh, the owner, Gerald Bruner, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, and it used to be known as Bruner Marsh. Um, he illegally destroyed some of the marsh area. He constructed an airfield and did a lot of other stuff. Um, in 2000, um, it was purchased by Bay Area Wetlands LLC with the intention of selling it to the highest bidding developer. Um, and so there was a long legal battle over the development, um, what was sort of to become of the marsh. Um, and then in May 2008, fortunately, the East Bay Regional Parks District purchased much of it and um, it became part of the park system. 
in 2017, they honored the Dotson family, um, which is um, Red Reverend Richard Dotson, who was one of the first um, residents and a, a basically an important um, person in the community of Parchester Village, and then Whitney Dotson, who is his son and was um, instrumental in um, preserving the marsh as habitat. Um, as an aside, Whitney Dotson was on Golden Gate Audubon's board at, at one time in his life, and he he brought people there and led um, birding trips to share the, the beauty of the birds out there. Um, so the habitat is um, marsh with a grassland upland. Um, and so the birds that you would expect in a grassland and marsh habitat are there. Um, so recently I was there and uh, meadow larks were, were all over the place and they were singing, really beautiful place to hear the singing meadow larks. Um, uh, we, lots of ducks in the winter. Um, and in fact, I had all three of our common teal species, green wing, blue wing, and cinnamon teal on one day in the winter, which is really cool. Uh, canvas backs, um, savanna sparrows are very abundant there as well. So it's a nice place to go and, um, and see pretty, pretty brave little uh, savanna sparrows that'll, that'll come pretty close to you. So um, the next uh, place I wanted to talk about is Arrowhead Marsh, um, which is part of Martin Luther King Jr. Shoreline, another East Bay Regional Park, and that's in Oakland. Um, so Arrowhead Marsh is this little arrowhead shaped um, chunk of land that is sort of nestled in between the Oakland airport and the um, stadium here. Um, the parking is free, um, but I wanted to mention that the parking lot does not open until 8 a.m. So if you wanna be super ambitious and get there before eight, you'll have to um, uh, take another entrance in, which there are other entrances. Um, but the easiest way to get in and, and go right up directly to the marsh area is um, down here. So basically if this is zoomed in here, so there's a road that kind of cut, cuts in here um, and there's a parking lot right there um, at the base of the arrowhead. Um, and uh, in that parking lot, there are restrooms and drinking fountains. Um, public transportation is not easy. I've barded and biked there, which is definitely doable. So it's um, just 2.2 miles from the Coliseum BART station um, and a, a little bit of a short walk from the 73 and 98 bus lines if, if, if you live on one of those. Um, the trail conditions are really great, very accessible, wide asphalt um, trails that are walking and biking trails. Um, yep. Um, and so this is a view of the marsh. Um, there's also a wooden boardwalk that kind of extends into the marsh. Um, and so the birds that you would expect to see there, again, um, Lots of different um, shorebirds in winter and uh, ducks in winter. Um, but I wanted to highlight, of course, the um, endangered Ridgeways rail. It's, um, in my opinion, it's the best place to see this bird. Um, it's almost always out in the mud flats foraging at low tide. In high tide, it kind of comes up to uh, roost in the, in the pickleweed. Um, and then there's sort of a so when the when the tide is low, it's a great place to go because the the birds are often um, uh, foraging in the exposed mud flats. And then, but then when the tide is really really high, um, it's kind of fun too because a lot of the shorebirds um, will come up onto that boardwalk. Um, so in super high tides, um, so that's that they'll congregate on the boardwalk together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I just wanted to say that we um, do a regular monthly um, habitat restoration and shoreline cleanup there. So if you wanna join us on the third Saturday from 9.30 to 12, um, please register online. You can come um, help us um, take trash out of the marsh, which um, is so important. I, I like to think every piece of trash we pick up is a piece of trash that doesn't wind up in the, in the Ridgeways rail habitat and then and subsequently the ocean. Um, and we remove invasive species and plant natives. So hopefully we'll see you out there with us. And then finally, I wanted to talk about um, Chain of Lakes. So heading 
uh, west out to San Francisco. Um, so um, North Lake is kind of a common um, birding hotspot, and you might have heard it heard of it in Golden Gate Park. Um, but Chain of Lakes is sort of the it's Chain of Lakes Drive, which is right here. Um, this is uh, Golden Gate Park, and um, Chain of Lakes Drive basically connects South Lake, Middle Lake, and North Lake. And um, it's it's small, so you can actually walk up and down this um, in in a morning or so. Um, uh, just just to go around North Lake, I think, is just about a mile, if if I have that right. It's not it's not a big, it's a tiny little man lake made, uh, you know, uh, urban park lakes. Um, so uh, this park is very um, accessible by uh, public transportation. So the five bus runs on Fulton. Um, so it's a really short walk from the Fulton five line. And then the N Judah train runs along the, the south of, of Golden Gate Park along Irving. Um, so it's just a short walk up from the N Judah. Um, and the trail conditions um, vary. So if you stay along Chain of Lakes Drive, or you're just going around um, North Lake, they're completely paved, um, nice sidewalks and, um, and accessible. But then I, um, there are tons of little trails that kind of go off of these um, parks. You can walk all the way around the bison paddock, which I'll talk about in a minute. And um, those trails are narrower and also um, uh, dirt, dirt trails. Um, and then there are restrooms um, sort of at the, just past the intersection. This is um, John F. Kennedy Drive, the main um, road through Golden Gate Park and um, Chain of Lakes Drive. Um, the restrooms, this is that intersection zoomed in and the restrooms are right here. So the habitat um, is, is interesting, you, you know, it's an urban, it's an urban park. So it's, um, it was, you know, planted. Um, so there, there's a lot of the exotic trees, um, but then in here um, behind our volunteers here are, is the lake. And so there's marsh um, habitat. And then we're doing a lot of work with San Francisco Recreation and Parks Department to sort of on these upper areas, plant more native plants. Um, and then I, oh, I forgot to say, that middle lake, which is right here in part of this chain of lakes um, walk, is actually um, closed right now. It's under under renovation. Um, they're doing a big, um, uh, like basically overhaul of the lake, um, but they're replanting a bunch of plants. And um, we, in consultation with the California Native Plant Society, helped um, helped out with uh, the plant list. And so I'm really excited um, in you know, maybe five years when they finish the, the construction part of the project and they get the plants in the ground and they start maturing, I think it's gonna be really great bird habitat. So that's exciting. So for now, Middle Lake is closed, but um, North Lake is open and you can go explore that and all these trails are open. Um, so, North Lake, to me, I think of uh, warblers and passerines, um, sparrows as well. Um, but there are common yellow throat there. You'll almost always hear them, if not see them. Um, uh, yellow warblers, especially in the fall, are there in abundance. Um, and then it, in the fall, uh, it really does become sort of a warbler trap. And there's lots of um, rare um, uh, vagrant warblers that uh, show up and are really fun to chase if you're into that. <laughs> um, so Allen's hummingbirds are there really regularly, um, lots of woodpeckers around like the uh, downy woodpecker here. And then pie-billed grebes um, breed on the lake. Um, and because it's such a small lake, you can, you can really get a good look at, their, at them and their babies in the spring. And then I wanted to point out, so right next to Chain of Lakes, so I'll go back to the map really quickly again, um, just, uh, let's see, east of the intersection of Chain of Lakes and John F. Kennedy Drive is the bison paddock. Um, so the, it is like a, an exhibit of bison um, in a big paddock, but what it does is it creates this big open field um, habitat, which is great for some of our birds. So, um, there are uh, tree swallow nest boxes all around the bison paddock. And um, we monitor those in the spring. 
And then if you come to our, um, uh, our regular monthly volunteer day at the, at the bison paddock in October, we open up all those boxes and we sort of look at what was in there and um, clean them out, of course, for the next spring, the coming spring. So you can join us for that um, fun project if you're interested. Um, so other, I just wanted to point out some other great spots. I just couldn't, it was so hard to narrow it down. Um, in the East Bay, I'm, I'm so glad Bob talked about Hayward and Coyote Hills. Um, uh, so in San Francisco, the Presidio is amazing. Um, they're doing a ton of restoration work there um, and um, doing a lot of work to restore that area to its historical ecology, which is very cool. Um, uh, in Golden Gate Park, I love the Oak Woodlands. Um, uh, there's also the Botanical Garden in Stowe Lake. The Oak Woodlands are kind of a hidden patch um, in the north, uh, northeast corner of the park. And they actually are um, remnant oaks from before, um, before um, urbanization of San Francisco Peninsula and, um, and the creation of the park. So it's kind of a cool little um, patch left. Um, Battery Godfrey is a great place to watch um, migration. Um, it's sort of the counterpart to Hawk Hill on the south side um, in San Francisco. And um, especially with the fall um, raptor migration, you can sort of stand on Battery Godfrey. You can see the hawks kettling up um, over Hawk Hill and then flying straight over you at Battery Godfrey. So if you're into that kind of birding, it's really fun. Um, Batteries to Bluffs Trail just below Battery Godfrey is um, one of the best places in the city, one of the only places to hear Rent It. Um, so there is a, a Rent It that's there singing. Uh, Glen Canyon Park is a great spot. Um, I should point out that Glen Canyon Park, if you don't have a car, is very easily accessible from BART. Um, there's the Glen Park um, BART station right next to it. Um, and again, that's uh, that's... I, th I, I think it's the second of the only two places in San Francisco where there's rented as well. Um, Heron's Head and Pier 94, of course, are amazing places to go. Um, Land's End is, uh, is awesome, um, a good place for sea watching. And um, Lake Merced has tons of birds. Um, on the East Bay side, um, in addition to the ones Bob talked about, are Lake Merritt. Uh, Tilden is amazing, uh, huge. I would start at the Botanical Garden if you haven't been there. Um, Albany, Albany Bulb is an amazing spot. Um, and in the winter, um, that's the Albany Bulb um, Plateau is a good place to see the um, a, a burrowing owls. Um, McLaughlin East Shore Shoreline Park in the Berkeley Meadow. And then Val Vista is um, one of my favorite places to go when I feel like I need to get out of my, get out of the urban areas and go a little further afield. But I just wanted to point out that a permit is required there. Um, all right, so that's, that's um, our, my presentation. So check out our website, goldengateaudubon.org and um, th think about becoming a member if you're not already. Um, thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Whitney. That was great. It was really lovely to hear about these places that are just hot spots, even among the really urbanized areas. And it goes to show how important it is to conserve these spaces because the birds do come and use them. Um, and we can, you know, thankfully go and enjoy them. So thanks again, Whitney. And so last but certainly not least, we have Jerry Britton, who is the president of Mount Diablo Audubon Society. So Jerry, over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so yes, as, uh, as Serena said, uh, my name is Jerry Britton. I'm the president of Mount Diablo Audubon. MountDiabloAudubon.org is our website. We represent Central and Eastern Contra Costa County. And I'm gonna focus on Eastern in this time. It's a very underburdened uh, uh, section of our greater East Bay, in my opinion. And so I'm going to for, uh, feature a couple of places out in East County today that uh, I encourage you all to visit if you can, Clifton Court, Four Bay, and Jersey Island. 
And so we'll start out uh, by going to Clifton Court Forbay first. Let me tell you just a little bit about it. Clifton Court Forbay, it's uh, in far eastern Contra Costa County. In fact, uh, it abuts uh, San Joaquin County on the east, and it's about 50 miles from San Francisco Bay. So it's a little bit of a drive. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, it's an eBird hotspot with about 230 species. And the Forbay is a, is a man-made reservoir. It's, it was built many decades ago for taking water from the Delta and storing it and then sending it south through the California aqueduct. And it goes all the way to the Southern uh, San Joaquin Valley uh, for farmland and uh, irrigation, et cetera. It's managed by the uh, California Department of Water Resources. <clears throat> Basically, it's an inland sea and it's noteworthy for attracting vagrants that are otherwise strictly coastal. But it also, and people don't realize this, I think, they think of it as just a big bay, maybe, that uh, has a lot of ducks and gulls and things on it. But it, it's got a great diversity of habitats. If you go, if you look at the countryside that surrounds it. And so, uh, for example, you know, tip, I go out there quite a bit and I see between 65 and 85 species every time I go. Although just last week I saw 97, which is a good haul for anywhere in any one place. <clears throat> and uh, basically any time of year can be interesting. So, just to give you a little bit of uh, orientation, here's Walnut Creek, uh, here's 680, 580, and way out here is Clifton Court Four Bay. Uh, it, this is the town, little tiny town of Byron. This is Highway J4 that goes from Byron to, uh, to Tracy. And so uh, on Highway J4, you, you turn off at Clifton Court Road, it's just a little short road that gets you to the to the bay here. And up here is the uh, town of Discovery Bay. Uh, Clifton Court, counting, counting birds at Clifton Court for Bay can, can be somewhat daunting. Uh, high counts, for example, except an eBird, accepted an eBird, uh, you know, 35,000 coots, uh, 17,000 scops, ruddy ducks and canvas back, 12,000 herring gulls, 10,000 gull, uh, glaucous wings, et cetera. And, and it's also quite large, uh, round trip distance out and back, 16 miles, if you wanna go the full route. Uh, so I use my bicycle. Other birders and fishermen use e-bikes and e-scooters. There, there is free parking. Although there unfortunately are no facilities and also to my knowledge, there's no uh, public transportation that can get you out there because this is quite a rural uh, part of the, of the county. And I would advise anybody that's going out there to check the wind forecast before going because it could be quite unpleasant if it's very windy, there's nothing to break that. And, uh, so I usually go, don't go out there if the wind is going to be over 12 miles an hour. It just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not fun, but uh, most of the days are very nice out there. So just to give you an idea here, here is an overhead view from Google Maps. Here's Cliff, here's Highway J4. Here's Clifton Court Road that goes out. And here's the parking right along what they call uh, Fisherman's Point, which is the end of this levee road out here. So right here, here where this white uh, circle is, is plenty of parking. Although, as I said, there's no facilities, although there is a security guard shack, and you could possibly ask them to use the facility. I've never done that. But from here, you, uh, you go through uh, an opening that's just large enough to, to get your bicycle through in a locked gate, and you head off along a paved levee road. And if you wanted to, you can go all the way around to about here. It, but here, they, there's no trespassing signs. And of course, when you get to here, there's open water. So you have to go all the way back the way you came. And if you did that, if you started at the parking lot and went all the way around 
to here and back, it would be about 16 miles. I usually don't do that. Uh, the one nice thing about this is you don't have to necessarily take the same route back. There's the paved levee road, but there are also roughly parallel dirt roads that you can get on, including this one here. And it gets you into a little bit different habitat or closer to some of the scrub. And so we have scrub areas here. The slough, of course, this is a Italian slough. We have some farmland, more scrub. There's a riparian area up here that's got uh, rookeries for herons and egrets and cormorants, etc. Lots of islands and trees, and it's very good habitat for lots of different things. Some more scrubs and marshland, farmland, and some seasonally flooded fields out here, which were very good this winter because of all the rain and lots of tundra swans and uh, other waterfowl were out here. It was very interesting. And of course, the open shallow bay. This is the average depth of this reservoir is only about six feet. So there's lots of diving ducks out here and all, all kinds of things. So here's a view uh, taken last month from the southeast corner of the four bay looking northwest towards uh, Mount Diablo when it had snow on it. Very beautiful sight. Here's a pelican. That little white blob there is a pelican in the in the water, and this is by the intake gates where they open up uh, open up and let water come in from what's called Old River, which used to be a waterway that was the San Joaquin River before. At some point in time, the San Joaquin changed its course, but anyway, so there the the water is fed from Old River into the bay, and then it's pumped out over the hills to Bethany Reservoir which is in Alameda County, just south of there, and then on down into the California Aqueduct. Here's another view of some of the scrub area that's uh, out here on the land side of the levee. And just over here, you can see the, uh, the paved road, which is the le uh, levee road, which is completely flat, very easy to bike. Uh, and another thing, when you're out here on, on any given day, you're gonna be the only birder out there. Uh, there's a few fishermen that come out on their e-bikes or scooters. There's some maintenance workers that drive out, not very many, but it's pretty lonely in general. Here's another view of back where, uh, in the area where I said there were, uh, there was riparian. Uh, this is when it's flooded, high tide with all the recent rains, but back here is what we call Eucalyptus Island. And these trees have immense numbers of egrets, and herons, and cormorants, nesting pair of bald eagles out here, which are pretty much seen every time you go out there, and lots of other good things. Uh, and this is just part of, uh, you know, combined habitat of the scrub and the sloughs, some trees, and uh, it's very good. And this is on uh, one of the parallel dirt roads that you can hop down on anytime you want and get closer to where there's some channels dug out and so where you can see a lot of sparrows and uh, other warblers in the spring and fall and lots of good stuff hanging out in these, these kind of habitats here. And just about at any place you can get back up onto the main levee road and continue on. So you don't necessarily have to take the same road out and back. And you never know what you're going to find out there. Uh, I've This is a picture I took of a uh, snowy plover. And they're, you know, they're not all, certainly not always there, but uh, you have a good chance to see one if you go out at, say, in April, usually April and May and even in, into the uh, late summer and fall, you can, you can get snowy plovers out here. And it's one of the few places uh, where you can find a black chinned hummingbird. Uh, white faced ibis, uh, any time of year, you can find them out there. Uh, usually flocks in the winter, uh, sometimes singletons like this one in the, in the summertime. And about a year and a half ago, I came upon a, a long-tailed Jaeger, believe it or not. This was a bird that 
is uh, breeds in the Arctic tundra and spends the winter months on the open ocean. But every once in a while, like I said, it's a it's kind of an inland sea that's a magnet for for species like this vagrants that come in and and chill out. So this uh, this Jaeger was here for just a day, as far as I know. But I was lucky enough to see it. Uh, here's a Sabin's gull, which for the last few years has been a regular in the fall. More than one of them. Have, this is again is a bird that. Uh, breeds in the Arctic tundra and spends the winter in the open ocean. But this is a juvenile, just like the Jaeger before that you saw was a juvenile. Uh, sometimes they lose their way, I guess, when they're first trying to navigate their migration. And uh, so this is just another you know, example of you'll never know what you're gonna find out here. And on top of that, uh, there can be hundreds of uh, Grebes out there, both Clarks and Western and, and Pied Builds too. And they, for the last few years in the southeastern part of the forebay, they've nested pretty close to shore. So you can get good looks at them when they're climbing up on their nests and sitting on their eggs. And then after the chicks hatch, you can get views of them uh, carrying around the chicks on their back like they do. And uh, right about this time of year, they're going to start their courtship display where they patter along on the water, the pair, and, uh, you know, do their, uh, their water dance. It's very, very nice to see. And so they'll be doing that shortly. Although they end up nesting later in the year, more, later than you might think. Uh, I think this picture was taken in August and they were still, or maybe late July, but they were still on eggs at that point. And you could also, in late summer and fall, Find the odd bank swallow. You have to be prepared to search through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tree, tree swallows on these uh, wires to see one, though. But it is a pretty reliable face, uh, place to see them, see bank swallows. So other highlights at Clifton Court Four Bay again: uh, heron, egret, and cormorant rookeries with hundreds of birds. Nesting bald eagles. In the recent past, uh, lesser nighthawk has been seen on summer evenings from if you park on Clifton Court Road and look to the west, uh, you can sometimes see uh, lesser nighthawks coursing around. Probably it's the only place I know of in the greater Bay Area where it's possible to do that. Another feature is uh, river otters are very common out there as are coyotes and beavers are regularly seen in the sloughs mainly. And there are also resident California sea lions living in the bay and feasting on huge carp. And they're, you know, it's surprising when you go out there and it's so many miles from the ocean and you hear, you know, you hear a sea lion and you end up seeing one or two or three, but they, uh, they're, they're very regular out there. And so that's, uh, that's uh, an overview of Clifton Court Four Bay and uh, I encourage you guys to go check it out at some point. And again, you'll probably be the only brooders out there. And, and there's not that many fishermen either, either, so it can be a lonely place out in the back, back part of it. But that's, a lot of times that's the way I like it. So my other uh, place that I'm featuring is Jersey Island. And now this is, very, this is a very underbrooded place. Uh, it's in Northeastern Contra Costa County. It's more, more delta birding. It's it's what the birds you would expect in the wintertime, at least, to see, to see out in the delta without having to go uh, out of Contra Costa County. Now, Jersey Island is owned by the Iron House Sanitary District, and they grow fodder crops, so, fodder crops, excuse me, silage and things like that. They uh, raise livestock and they dispose of uh, biosolids out there. You can get a permit to hike out there. Uh, I normally just do car birding. Uh, uh, Jersey Island is open ground, uh, mostly pasture, but it's got canals and ditches and blackberry brambles as well. Lots of seasonally flooded fields, especially this year. Huge numbers of waterfall, waterfowl every winter and a very large concentration of raptors. And this is car birding basically uh, from a levee road in this road, you access, I'll show you on the next map, but uh, off of Cypress Road coming out of Oakley towards Bethel Island. 
you turn left on uh, Jersey Island Road. Once you get up over the bridge, you're on Jersey Island. And the only, there's only one house that I know of on Jersey Island. So it's not habited. Uh, hap, uh, and so the only traffic on this road are people that are taking the ferry to Bradford Island. And there's hardly anybody that lives on Bradford Island. So there's never anybody on this road. There's also no facilities. Uh, I think it can be birded very easily by bicycle. I've, I've never done that though. Uh, when you're out there, a scope is helpful because you're looking at a lot of times uh, waterfowl and things from a distance. The only the other thing to note is that the road is closed early on weekends. The road is only open when the ferry to Bradford Island is operating. And so there's if you go to the BradfordIsland.com ferry info, you can see the operating schedule. And usually about an hour after the last ferry comes across from Bradford, New Jersey, they put, put a gate across the road and it's closed. And so you have to be mindful of that. And it's it's open till five on week weekdays, but it, it closes early on weekends, usually by, by I think by one o'clock on Saturday and maybe three o'clock on Sunday. I'm not sure exactly, but you'd have to look. <clears throat> so here, here again is, uh, is a map that shows, here is uh, Highway 160 that goes, here's the Antioch Bridge. For those of you, goes off to Rio Vista, as you've been out there. This is Highway 4. And if you get on to Cypress Road from Highway 4, this is at Cypress Road, turn off onto Jersey Island Road. Here's the bridge. And right here, you're on Jersey Island. And there's a section here that, that is straight. And then you make a right turn and get up on the levee. And you go on the levee all the way to the ferry terminal where the Bradford Island Ferry is. And that, that's a place you have to turn around and go back. If you had a permit to hike, which you can get from uh, the Iron House Sanitary, Sanitary District, you can hike along this levee from here. You can park and hike. I have never done that. And from here, you can, you can go over to Bradford Island. I understand that they've doubled, they just doubled their price. So now it's, it's more than $15 for the ferry ticket to go across from uh, from Jersey to Bradford. And you just have to make sure that you arrange it so that you get back. You have to know when the last ferry leaves from Bradford to Jersey. Otherwise, you'll be stuck overnight on Bradford Island. And here's Bethel Island right here, right across the slough. This is, uh, this is Dutch slough. Can't remember the name of this slough, but this is, uh, this is Bethel Island here. So what would you expect to see on Jersey Island? Well, in the wintertime, you get massive flocks of greater white fronted and snow geese, dabbling ducks uh, of all kinds, and some diving ducks. Uh, massive flocks of tricolored, yellow headed, and other blackbirds, white faced ibis, sandhill cranes, ferruginous hawks. It's probably the most reliable place in the whole greater Bay Area to find a cattle egret. They're not that uncommon out there. In the spring and summer, you can find blue grosbeak, western kingbird, horned lark, Swainson's hawk, and these are you know these are birds that are again birds of the inland uh, empire of California and not that common anywhere else in the in what we consider the Bay Area. And there's resident specialties: uh, ring-necked pheasant live out there. You see them every time you go out there. Also, loggerhead shrike. A few photos of out there. This is a view from the levee road looking west to the Antioch Bridge in the distance. You can see flocks of snow geese right here. This is taken in February, uh, just after the big snowstorms. And lots of flooded fields at this time of year. And of course, they dry out over the summer. And other birds come in, but wintertime is basically the best time to go here to see the, you know, the thousands of waterfowl. And here's looking southwest to Mount Diablo again in the distance. Uh, and here's, here's some of the populated area of Antioch over here. Again, more snow geese in the foreground. 
this is the pasture land. And again, there's, uh, there's other, some, some briar and some uh, ditch and other kind of scrubby habitat as well. Here's an example of some of the scrubby areas that you'll see on the road leading up to the levee road. And some of the birds you'll find out there, again, greater white-fronted geese, uh, thousands of them. Here, out of focus here, you can see shovelers and northern pintails in one of the flooded fields. Uh, a Virginia rail is a good, uh, it's a good chance to, uh, as good as anywhere, I guess, to, to uh, get a photo of one of these. You can certainly uh, call one out. Also, Soras. And lesser yellow legs. Uh, I think Ethan Monk just the other day reported 34 lesser yellow legs out here. And so this is probably one of the best places in the greater Bay Area to see, to see that bird. Here he is, uh, or it is, uh, relative to a black neck stilt. There's a shoveler in the background as well, a couple of them. So yellow, uh, excuse me, lesser yellow legs, a lots, of course, greater yellow legs, and dowagers as well. Uh, uh, and Dunlin and least, not so much Western, but more shorebirds than you might think come out, come out here. And so just to give you a perspective, here's the entirety of Contra Costa County. So here's uh, you know, the Golden Gate Audubon territory that uh, was discussed just previously. And the places I highlighted are way out here, the Northeast and Eastern Contra Costa. Here's Jersey Island, uh, just east between Antioch and Bethel Island. Way down here in the corner is uh, Clifton Court Four Bay. And you know, for other areas in uh, in Contra Costa, in our, in our uh, Bailiwick, of course, Mitchell Canyon, which is right here, is a very famous uh, birding hotspot, especially in spring for warblers, et cetera. Uh, Black Diamond Mines, South Antioch is right here. It's good for, it's fairly reliable for things like uh, Lawrence's Goldfinch, et cetera. And then there's the whole Morgan Territory Preserve out here, which is, it's a massive land holding that up against Mount Diablo, and I happen to live out here, right about where the star is, and so I know it pretty well. But I end up going out here if I want to see a whole lot of birds, because uh, this is where this is where you can get just big numbers of species out here in uh, at Clifton Court. So again, uh, uh, to summarize, uh, talked about birding spots in East Contra Costa County, featuring Clifton Court, Four Bay, and Jersey Island. Here's contact information. If anybody uh, wants uh, to head out there and wants more information or maybe just to hook up, you know, I'll, I go out there a lot. I'll take you. You can reach me at president at mountdiabloaudubon.org. Uh, Mount Diablo Audubon also has uh, lots of field trips every month. You can go look at those at mountdiabloaudubon.org, uh, birding slash field trips, and, uh, and find something that it tickles your fancy and thanks thanks so much for your attention thank you so much jerry it was so cool to see the variety of habitat that you highlighted as well as the sheer number of birds that can be out there that's really amazing so thank you so much jerry um mm -hmm. so now um what i'd like to do is invite our speakers back uh, bob and whitney as well um, we can take some questions and answers here and as a reminder to everybody, if you have a question, go ahead and enter that in the chat. If it's for a specific speaker, it would help me if you let me know who it's for. Um, but we do have plenty of time for questions. I did see a couple in the chat that I can go ahead and start with. Um, so I guess from our most recent uh, speaker, Jerry, we had a couple of questions. Um, one is, uh, is, um, Clifton Court Four Bay is that a public land? Well, it's it's managed again by the California Department of uh, Water Resources. So yes, it is public. It's free of charge. 
uh, again, there's, there's no facilities, but parking is free. And once you get there, you can, you can go through the, the pedestrian entrance, which is just to the side of the lock gate. And from there, you've got miles and miles of paved and unpaved, le unpaved levee roads to go on and it's all free. Awesome, thanks. And uh, do you happen to know how the sea lions got there? <laughs> you know, they, they could haul themselves up and over the levee and back down. But they could also, when when they when they let open these massive gates to let the water in, they could probably just surf through that. Uh, you know, they 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 have these these big uh, uh, curved steel gates that uh, some hydraulic mechanism raises it, and the water shoots in from from the let from the uh, slough, and I think. Uh, when they're open, I think a sea lion can just get right in. But once he's in, uh, he'd have to haul, you know, he'd have to get out the hard way or else swim against a very strong current to get back through the other way. Very interesting. And I just also wanted to highlight, there was a, a question earlier for Bob about uh, if there were any recommended trails, favorite trails for birding at Coyote Hills, since there are so many to choose from. And Bob, thank you for answering that in the chat. Um, you mentioned the Bay Trail being good for viewing the salt ponds, as well as accessing freshwater ponds, and also recommended the Jechenyo, Muskrat, and Willow Trails. Um, anything else that you or Whitney want to add to that? Um, I wouldn't say, I don't have too much more to add. Um, yeah, I just appreciate the opportunity to, to share in some birding locations from our area and also to, to see the, you know, underbirded areas that were highlighted for, uh, from other people. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then uh, we had another question just come in for Jerry. Uh, what resource do you use to check for the wind forecast before heading out? to uh, Clifton Court for Bay. I, um, you know, I, I Googled uh, Discovery Bay wind, uh, wind forecast because Discovery Bay is right, you know, it, it's a, you know, there's several thousand people that live there. It's a town, it's got its own. So, uh, and, and it's just a few miles north of Clifton Court. And, and that's pretty reliable usually. So if you, if you see it's gonna be a windy day at Discovery Bay, you know, it's gonna be a windy day. So just look at the Discovery Bay wind forecast. Awesome, thank you, Jerry. And then another question for all speakers. Can you recommend any surefire places to see rails or soras and the best time of day, year, or tide to spot them? So maybe, um, maybe we'll start with Whitney. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, is there ever reliable rail sources, I don't know, but um, yeah, in uh, San Francisco, actually, surprisingly, Lake Merced is actually a really great spot. Um, at the very least, at dusk, I usually hear them, um, or, or sometimes early, early in the morning as well, uh, Virginia Rail and Sora in particular there. Um, but yeah, there, there's a, there, on the concrete bridge at Lake Merced in San Francisco, there's a little spot where on the north side of the concrete bridge, there's like a little trail that goes into some willows. And there's a spot where you can kind of see into the reeds. And I've seen Virginia rail there pretty reliably. I'm, I'm curious about everybody, uh, the other's answers too. Uh, yeah, there's, you know, almost any marshland out in East County has both Virginia rails and soras. Uh, there's at Los Vaqueros Reservoir uh, at the Walnut Creek staging area. I heard both out there just the other day. But to, and to to see them, you just have to have the patience. And you know, you can call them and they'll 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 sound back. But whether they come out and look is another story. And you just get lucky once in a while. Um, yeah, and from my, uh, my side, I would say that uh, the, the Turchenyo Trail and Muskrat Trail that go on the boardwalks through the freshwater marsh in Coyote Hills are both excellent for seeing 
uh, Virginia rails and Soras during the winter time. Um, the, the, the boardwalks just take you right into the marsh. And so you get into some places where they're, you can see them a little bit closer. Um, and uh, yeah, the other spot uh, was the one that Whitney mentioned, uh, Arrowhead Marsh. Um, during high tide events at Arrowhead Marsh, all the rails get forced up out of the, the marsh. And, and they're, so you'll often see them like either swimming or on the edge of the marsh in Arrowhead Marsh. Um, and you can see Sora's, Virginia, and uh, Ridgeway's rails all coming out at, during those high tide events. Awesome, thank you. And then uh, thanks, Whitney, for answering that fall through winter seems to be a great time of year for seeing rails as well. Great. Um, I also just got a question. Um, if you ever see newts, salamanders, and turtles at any of these locations that you've mentioned. Uh, yeah, definitely. There are um, newts and salamanders, both uh, in Garen. Um, obviously, the, only, the main time you're going to see uh, newts moving between creeks and, and uh, other water areas is during the winter time when it's actually quite wet out. Uh, so we may be past the time when um, you're going to see most uh, newts or salamanders. But um, yeah, there are a few turtles in the, you know, in, in various ponds, but most turtles are non-native, uh, it seems like. How about you, Whitney? Um, any new salamanders or turtles at your spots? Yeah, I don't know, actually. I'm, I'm sadly <laughs> um, uh, too bird focused. I need to think about those animals as well. <laughs> Jerry? There's a lot of turtles out at Clifton. Uh, not that many newts, although I've seen a lot of uh, funny looking insects out there, like assassin bugs, and you know, just some crazy stuff to me anyway. I'm not an entomologist or not even a pretend one, but uh, yeah, I don't recall seeing, seeing any newts out there, but plenty of turtles. And also, like I said, big, uh, big schools of, of uh, striped bass. Sometimes there's a feeding frenzy and also carp everywhere. And, uh, yeah, good stuff. Nice, thank you. Um, and then another question that came in is whether short-eared owls can still be seen uh, perhaps at this time of year at any of your spots? Um, it's getting just a little bit late right now for short-eared owls. Um, I did see one um, two weekends ago, um, but most of them are gonna be migrating out of the area and heading to their breeding grounds. Uh, there's, looks like there's a question for me. Uh, is Los Vaqueros open now and are there nesting eagles? Uh, there are some trails that are closed for that reason that there are nesting eagles, uh, but there are a lot of trails open as well. So they will, you know, if you contact the watershed, Contra Costa uh, Water District, they will send you a map of what trails are closed and what are open. And it's, it's hit or miss, but uh, yes, at this point, some are closed because because of uh, nesting golden eagles. Awesome, thank you for that. All right, um, okay, we have a couple more questions that just came in. Is there a map of which Audubon societies cover what areas? Sometimes I'm not sure what website to check for field trips, et cetera. Um, does anyone have any ideas for resources there? I, we need better maps, <laughs> but no, I, I, uh, I don't think so. Um, I would say just check out our websites and you'll kind of, for the field trip lists, and you'll kind of get a sense of where we regularly go. A lot of our field trips to Golden Gate Audubon are sort of regular locations, and um, you know, you'll kind of get a sense that way. I'm not sure. Anything else uh, you want to add, Bob? Uh, no, just that, uh, you know, 
uh, Ohlone Audubon covers Southern and Eastern Alameda County only. So the Northern parts that include Oakland and, and the cities, uh, we don't cover that, but I don't think there's a, a, an, a, I don't know if we have an official map of our territory. Yeah, and it, as, for, as for Mount Diablo Audubon, it's central and east county. Basically, in Contra Costa County, it's east of the Oakland Hills. Uh, there's, you know, certainly Walnut Creek and, and there east. And then there's a, kind of a no man's land when you get to, uh, you know, places like uh, uh, Crockett, and places like that. Thanks. And Susan in the chat also recommended checking out California Audubon um, as a potential resource for a map as well. So thank you for that, Susan. All right. Um, let's see. I don't think I have any other questions in the chat at the moment. I think um, there, there are some other comments and helpful tips from folks. Um, uh, and then there's a question about information about how to register for the other two upcoming presentations. So yes, I will be sending those out in the follow-up email. So you will definitely get those directly in your inbox. And I hope to see you in a couple of weeks um, for our next one, which will be with Sequoia Audubon and Santa Clara County Audubon. So we're going uh, quite a bit further south and west to the peninsula. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. And lots of thank yous here, of course. Uh, people found it super informative, which I I also did. Um, the whole point of this was to bring together groups and also provide resources for people to check out some, hopefully some new places that they hadn't known about before. So I hope you're all inspired to check out some, some great places that were highlighted today. And also to check out each of these organizations that are doing so much great work to engage people with birds and you know they're doing all kinds of field trips all the time so definitely check them out um, and I know many of you also have volunteer opportunities um, especially uh, those that were highlighted uh, so yeah definitely go ahead and check those out so once again thank you everybody thank you to all the speakers especially uh, for taking the time to put together these great presentations and highlight these spots. Spring is obviously a very busy time of year for many of our local birding organizations, so we really do appreciate it. Thank you to everybody who attended this evening. Um, we love seeing uh, that people are joining from all over and getting something out of this, so we really appreciate that as well. Um, and once again, remember to visit each organization's website, follow them on social media, subscribe to their email lists, and join their bird outings, and become a member of these groups because uh, that support really goes a long way. So um, once again, thank you. Um, any any last things that you all want to say to the audience before we sign off? So maybe we can start uh, with Whitney. Go ahead. Thanks so much for having us, and uh, hope to see everybody out there in the field. Absolutely. Uh, Bob, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, thanks. It was a, a lot of fun to put this together and just really fun to see everyone else's uh, presentations too. I'm looking forward to the upcoming one, the upcoming events, the second series. And Jerry, anything you want to add? Yeah, I'll just echo Bob's uh, statement that, you know, it's it was fun to see uh, the highlights of everybody's different uh, territories. And uh, yeah, it and again, it, you know, People can just contact me. Hopefully that information is still is going to be available uh, uh, on the recorded version. And uh, if, you're, if you have more questions about birding, some of the places out here that uh, are underbirded in my opinion. Absolutely. Thank you all once again so much. Mm -hmm.